teaching our children. Our children imitate us. And what becomes of them later on is what they, their children will imitate in them. So the first thing is, brothers and sisters, before I speak about the rights of the parents, is that first of all, the onus is on the parents, first and foremost, to create a relationship with their children before they grow up and become what we call independent. As soon as they hit the age of teenagers, we know, and you men know, and you sisters know, how it is, you've been through it. When you became teenagers, especially the men, we begin to develop a slight ego. And if we don't look after it, we like to declare independence. In the past, the daughters remained a little bit more loyal to the family and the parents. And the boy was taught to become independent. In the 21st century we live in, and especially after World War I, the fall of the Khilafah, the last of the Khilafah, which was the Ottoman Empire, whereby the clinging to the deen and its teachings had lost its value, and the kings and sultans and princes and the Khulafa begin to think materialistically, thinking about position, people among the Romans and the Byzantines and uh, even at the time of the Mongols, they were invading the Muslim lands while the Muslims were arguing who is better, Ali radiallahu anhu or Muawiyah. Time has changed. World War I occurred and whoever is responsible, we understand they are the enemies of the Khilafah, the enemies of Islam. They wanted to break this bond of this Islam which Allah subhanahu wa taught us in the Qur'an once and for all. And the best way they did it was first of all to divide us into nations. I'm coming to the topic inshallah very soon. It's very important to know this. To divide us into nations calling us nationalities. And they put this love in our hearts as though this is what needs to be done. As though this is normal to create our own flags, to have an identity separate from anyone else. And we gave names to different kind of different flags, based on our color, and, and we created our own language. Obviously there were languages before, but we called this language uh, attached to the flag or to the nationality. We think that this is good, but in fact this was one of the plans of dividing. When they did that, and we fell for the trap, what happened? The Muslim families themselves began to divide as well into tribalism. And this is when I said we've returned back to Jahiliyyah. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his last sermon in Hajj, three months before he died, he gave his last sermon to the Muslims and said to them, among the words he said to them were, and leave the practices of Jahiliyyah behind me, for today I step on it and it is beneath my feet. Do not return striking each other's necks and cutting off the family ties that share the womb. Leave tribalism and nationalism alone behind you. For those who followed it before you, I'm giving you the meaning of what he said, for those who followed it before you were, were destroyed. It is nafina. It is like a stinking carcass. So first they divided us into nations, then we became into tribal warfare, then the families themselves begin to divide, the brother with his brother, the brother with his sister, until you found within one family unit, in the Western culture, unfortunately in the Muslim world, we've taken on this attitude, where the boy and the girl grow up, to the point where they become teenagers, and they feel that they must now leave their parents and run their own course in life. As though the parents have no longer any right towards their children, because now they're adults. And the West placed a number, an age, they said 18, or in some countries 19 or whatever it is, but 18 in general, when you become 18 you're an adult, boy and girl. Again, 
They placed an age. They didn't just stop with nationalism and independence. They placed an age. When you're 18, then you are completely independent. And what does it mean? It means that they can drive. I don't know how it is in Sri Lanka, but in Australia, the Western world. You can drive and now you can buy liquor and drink alcohol. And that you'll be imprisoned. And, and, and if you go with a, a partner who is under 18, it's considered pedophilia and all these things begin to apply to that individual. Telling the boy and the girl when you're 18, you've got to now detach yourself from the family units in an indirect manner. And this is exactly what is happening. I recall, Wallahi, uh, I remember when I was about 21 years old, we had a neighbor, an Australian neighbor, but these were what we call Anglican, Anglican backgrounds. So they came from Britain and uh, they're something like seventh or, or eighth generation Australians. We call them the white collar Australians, the original uh, rednecks, if you like. They're the original uh, people who came into Australia at the time of the Aborigines with Captain Cook. I don't know if you know the history behind it. But what she, there was a mother who was our neighbor. She asked me, how old are you? I said, I'm 21. She said, oof, and you're still living with your parents? I said, of course. She said, as soon as my son hit 19, I wanted him out. I asked, but why? She said, that's it, he can go on along with his life. You know, I'm not going to sit there looking after him even after when he's 19. It's a burden. I can't stand having him in my home. I said, it's amazing. In our culture, it's very different, quite the opposite. Our parents look after us and care for us from when we are born until we hit this age, when we are able to look after ourselves. And now we have to repay them. Instead of them looking after me, now it's my turn. So I live with them to look after them. And I share in the expenses and I cater for them and so on and so forth. Somehow it didn't register in her head, I don't know. She said, oh, I can't stand it, my son's out. And it reminded me of one of the, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about these particular strengths. She was a very nice lady, actually. Good character in every other way. But this, this concept, this character, reminded me of one of those discovery channels about the animal kingdom about the crocodile, the reptiles. The crocodile lays its eggs and the only thing it does is that it puts some dirt on the eggs and goes off, the mother. It doesn't know who its husband is, doesn't know, doesn't care, and the crocodile's gone. The eggs have to hatch and it's up to them, survival of the fittest. They hatch and they've got to survive. If you survive, you survive. If you don't, oh, bad luck. It's your life, not mine. It also reminded me of the ayah in Surah Al-Ankabut where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مثل الذين اتخذوا من دون الله أولياء كمثل العنكبوت كمثل العنكبوت اتخذت بيتا وإن أوهن البيوت لبيت العنكبوت لو كانوا يعلمون Allah says, the example or the similitude, the analogy of those who take as authority figures, as those who govern their affairs, who tell them how to live their lives, those who take these as their governors of their lives, whether it be idols, whether it be government of a particular sort, whether it be a, a people, a, a civilization other than the Islamic one, who allow them to govern how they live in their homes and outside and in their hearts and how they think in their ideology are like the spider. The spider who creates for itself a family, a bait, a house. And verily indeed, the home of the spider is among the most weakest. لو كانوا يعلمون If only they knew. Past scholars, when they went into the tafsir of this ayah, they were thinking of the web of the spider itself. The web. They said, well, you know, by looking at the web, we can see that the threads of the web are the weakest. The easy breeze, just a simple breeze, can make this web come apart. You touch it, it's gone. Those are the past scholars. Contemporary scholars, they said, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains at the end of this, لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ If only they knew. And they studied saying, if only they knew what about the spider's home. Everybody knows that the web is weak. 
But then they said it could also mean the actual family makeup of the spider. And when they looked at scientific evidence and research, they found that a female spider, when the male spider mates with it, and usually the male spider is smaller in build than the female spider. I don't know if you knew this. It's smaller in, in size. It mates with the female spider. This female spider becomes pregnant with, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of babies. And once it does that, the female spider turns against the male spider while the male spider tries to run away. But it catches the, the male spider 90% of the time and kills him. The wife kills her husband. Out of my life, I don't need you anymore. I don't need you anymore. I can work, I've got my own income, you know, like that. You know, I can look after myself, you've done what you want, I've got what I received, I don't need you anymore. Then, it gives birth to the spiders. Its babies turn against each other, while the female spider runs away. The spiders begin to fight, some of them run, some of them kill each other, survival of the fittest. There is no family makeup that is bonding them. Contemporary Mufassirun say, Allah knows best, this is the fabric of families, society, society today, of how families work, like the family of the spider. And we can see in the Western world that this is truly the case. And I'm not here to have a go with the Western world. But what I am saying is the truth. Statistically, scientifically, by research, even among non-Muslims read about it. It's all over the internet and in their own books. I once had an interview with uh, the Age newspaper back in Australia, in Melbourne. And they asked me about Islam and the family, and I said, Islam places the utmost importance on family. I said, you have a lot to learn from the Islamic way of life in relation to family makeup. Because you are yet to learn a lot from it. They said, we are a Christian country who follows the Bible, that, you know, and a lot of us are secular. I said, that's the problem. In a secular society, you make up your laws and you make up your concepts and principles as you learn them along the way. And that's why you're changing your laws. As for a Christian society, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is an honorable prophet of ours. However, he was not a married man. For this reason, Christians themselves have little understanding of what a family should be even though they have some understanding through the Bible. If you do not have the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have ample information about the Prophet, peace be upon him, in his family to minute detail, then you cannot complete the understand, your understanding of a family life. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when I was, uh, I was a public relations officer, when I was back at university, public relations officer at a local masjid, uh, one of the most popular masjids in Melbourne, Islamic Council of Victoria, uh, Society of Victoria, uh, one of the oldest, and we used to receive so many phone calls. Uh, one day, I received a phone call on Jumwa, and it was a lady from Lebanon, elderly lady. She's on the phone, and she asks me, are you the person who gives the khutbah some time, or you translate in English? I said, yes. And then suddenly her voice changed, she started to cry. She said to me, can't you speak to the young people? I said, about what? She said, my son, he beats me up every day. Last night he put me on the floor and he trampled on me. He stepped on my back. And what am I saying to him? Because he asked me for money and I wouldn't give him money. And I know that he's going using it on drugs. I know that he's going out and doing things. I don't want harm to come to him. But when I don't give him money, he starts to beat me up. This is not the first time I hear these. But Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about one of the signs of the last hour is that children who grow up will begin to beat their own parents. In Tirmidhi, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us when the son, he brings his friends closer and his father further favors his friends upon his father, above his father. Which is inside Bukhari and Muslim, that when the woman begins to give birth to a daughter, who later on begins to have authority over her, 
this is the correct one of the most correct opinion among the scholars did you know a time will come when people will curse their own mother and father this is happening every day they curse their own mothers and fathers we hear it all the time I had a neighbor I used to hear them every day almost every day day in day out the daughter used to scream at her mother and I used to hear it and the daughter would go to the backyard screaming out the words I hate you it's not fair I hate you I hate your guts mother swearing at her daughter and the daughter swearing at her mother we hear so much about the society today but what makes me very sad and sorrowful is unfortunately a lot of this information now is emanating from Muslim communities themselves as a teacher I hear students say this in the playground students swear at each other's mothers and fathers and the other one laughs about it they accept it as joking Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said may Allah curse the one who swears at his own father or mother they said Ya Rasul Allah who would curse their own mother and father he said there will come a time when people will curse others mothers and fathers and by that they have cursed their own and I will give you the reference shortly insha'Allah about that my brothers and sisters in Islam Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us about how our nation can be built on strength and good morals and how we can return back to our strength and once earned glory it starts from the individual secondly from the family makeup and then it extends into the neighborhood to the community which makes up society which makes up a country which makes up the world uh, there is a little story just before I go into the rights of the parents there was a, a alim in one of the western countries he wanted to deliver the khutbah on a Friday and he didn't know what topic to deliver to the people to add to that his little son was five years old he's running around him daddy 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 dad 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 I heard this story from a speaker by the name of Siraj Wahaj I don't know if you've heard this story he said daddy 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 the Imam is there sitting trying to think so he takes his little son into a little room and he finds a book opens the book and finds the map of the world and then he cuts up this map of the world into little shreds and gives it to his son and says son if you can put this map together I will give you five dollars father goes back thinking about his khutbah holding his pen and paper five minutes later his five-year-old son comes back daddy 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 the man looks at his son and says what now he says look I put the map together he looks at the map truly five-year-old son put all the continents all the states all the oceans in absolutely the right place looks at his son and says son how did you do this the son says easy dad before you cut up the page you didn't see on the back of the page there was a picture of a man and I thought that if I can put the map will come together by itself the Imam looks at his son and he says son good on you here is your five dollars and thank you for helping me figure out the topic for my khutbah today if you put the man together the world will come together so my address tonight is first and foremost to the young generation to the youth and secondly to the parents of these youth and thirdly to the elderly of the parents of this youth you know why we all have parents or had parents so this applies to all of us but first and foremost to the youth now I'm going to ask a dangerous question so be careful in case I pick on you okay hands up if you consider yourself a youth 
No one? There we are. We've got a youth. I'm just scaring you when I said dangerous questions because sometimes a 50-year-old man will say, I'm a youth. Yeah, I feel he feels like he's 19, 18. Any youth here, put your hands up, really. If you're a youth, young man. Brother Azad, come on. <laughs> okay, I still consider Brother Azad a youth. MashaAllah, the other day I saw him uh, doing a high jump. Over. No, I'm just joking. MashaAllah, we've got lots of youth. I can see in front of me at least, I can see at least about, just by looking at you, at least 50. And that's not counting you, inshallah. All right, hands up if you feel that you're still 20. Hands up if you feel that you're 20. MashaAllah, Sri Lankan community is very different than the one in Australia. You ask a 60-year-old man, he says, I feel like I'm 18. The next day he goes and gets married. I remember one Sheikh uh, called Sheikh Wahid, uh, father of a good friend of mine, uh, about 70, 80 years old. He comes into Fajr prayer one day, and he was a bit late. And usually he's always on time. And he was in the fourth row. You know, Fajr time is only about three or four rows. He's in the fourth row, and suddenly he says, uh, Please forgive me for my lateness this morning. I got married. <laughs> I looked at him, I said, Sheikh Wahid, you got married? Because his wife had died. He said, yes, yes, I got married. Yes. I'm eight, mashallah. He said, I feel like I'm 19. Old very quick. You could see it on his face, older. <laughs> anyway, the youth, my brothers and sisters in Islam. You don't understand how serious it is. I don't know if I can give this topic its rights. But however, if you don't understand the awe of this topic, then at least you will believe the creator of the man and the woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us begin with a beautiful verse in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Isra, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم and I beg your attention for these verses are not just there like that they have deeper meaning than what you think in fact the more you read them the more you understand that there is deeper meaning in them Allah says وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا وبالوالدين إحسانا وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما فلا تقل لهما ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما واخفض لهما جناح الذل من الرحمة وقل رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا الله سيز and your Lord has strictly commanded you that you worship none other but Him. That you worship none other but Him. And to be absolutely good towards your parents. Ihsan. Ihsan means more than just good. It means to exert absolute goodness even at the times when you are struggling and don't feel like doing it, continue. No matter how old they become in age, if you live and they live to the time when you see them grow old and frail, then never in all these years dare to even be bad to them, as little as pronouncing a sound of oof towards them. Don't even say oof towards them. And do not talk to them harshly. 
Do not talk to them in a rough manner, in a harsh tone. Allah is not even saying the words. He's saying the tone, the tone, the sound of your voice. Don't even talk with a harsh tone, a rough tone. وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا But remember, always choose the most generous and beautiful words to say to them. And lower the wing of humility towards them out of mercy. Out of what? Mercy, mercy. Not respect, not kindness, but mercy. Because the word rahma has deeper meaning than kindness and respect. And say, O oh my Lord, give them mercy the same way they gave me mercy as they raised me from when I was a child. Such deep meanings in this verse, brothers and sisters. I don't know how, whether you understand them or not. But I'll try just to give you, just sort of in a nutshell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa qada. qada is used when a judge rules in a court. Once he puts the hammer down, no one can go against it. The police come and take you. Wa qada rabbuk. Your Lord has decreed. There is no, no one can go against it. That you worship none other but Him and to be absolutely good towards your parents, brothers and sisters. Did you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the two together in one sentence? In one sentence. Like no, there's no full stop between worshipping Allah alone and being good towards your parents in absolutes. There's no full stop. The only difference between the worship of Allah alone and the dutifulness towards parents is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the worship of Allah alone in the same sentence before mentioning the dutifulness towards parents. That's the only difference because in the Arabic language, in, the, in one sentence, whatever you mention before another, it means it's a sequence. This is more important than that. That's the only difference. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the worship of Allah alone, then follows it by being dutiful towards the parents. Why? The scholars say, because the origin of life the origin of your existence is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala originally. And the secondary origin is from your parents. In other words, you came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His creation of Adam alayhi salam. And thereafter, until the end of time, your creation is from your parents. So as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making a connection between His creation of us and the status of parents in your creation from them. Yani Ibn Abbas says, the most important after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger are your parents. Because this is the origin of your life. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us whether they grow old in age. Why did He mention age as being old? You know why? Naturally, when a child grows into an adolescent and sees their parents grow old and frail, their parents begin to become annoying when they're old. They begin to have too many demands. They become almost like children, some of them. Allah does tell us this in the Quran. وَمِنْكُمْ مَا يُرَدُّ إِلَىٰ أَرْضَ الْعُمْرِ لِكَيْ لَا يَعْلَى مِنْ بَعْدِ عِلْمٍ شَيْئًا Some of you return back to the feeble, weak age. And what they knew, they no longer know. So they become dependent upon their children. And in that time, they become very annoying to their children because the, you see the son or the daughter, they're married now. They've got their own children to look after. They've got their own spouse to look after. They've got their own home. They've got their work, their job, their time. They've got no more time for their parents. And this nagging father and this nagging mother becomes suddenly a burden upon their chest. If I asked any young person here, do you love your parents? Put your hand up. You love your parents? Jazakumullah khay. See how many hands up went up? And I said, if I asked any young person, <laughs> everyone put their hand up this time. Jazakumullah khay. You know why? Naturally. Because when you, no matter even if you're 60 or 70 years old, if I mention parents, what do you feel like? You feel like a child again. My mother, who is now in her high 50s, she says, you're my oldest son and you're 35. Every time I look at you, I can't see you as this old, this, this man at 35. I look at you as my little son. 
still that five-year-old son running around me, wanting his mother's attention. Look at me, mum, I can do the handstand. Like that. And really when I'm with my mother, I put my head, I tuck it into her, uh, into her shoulders and into her chest, you know, like, I just feel like a baby again. <laughs> and sometimes I act like a baby. No. That's the nature. However, when they grow old, we become annoyed by them. And we distance ourselves from them. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah says, lower the wing of humility towards them out of mercy. And I explained, why did Allah say mercy, not respect? And why did He not mention out of love or out of kindness? Because mercy plays a different role in life. Rahmah means, when somebody does something bad towards you, takes your right away. And they deserve in normal circumstances to be punished. Here, the only thing that will save that person is not rights. This for that. Not justice. Not kindness, not respect. It is mercy. Rahmah. Mercy is when someone does something wrong towards you and takes your right and they deserve in normal circumstances to be punished in the court of law. Injustice. But instead you exercise mercy and you pardon them. Without even any apology, without taking your right back. You just let them go. Allah mentioned this towards the parents. And I hear many youth in my life, I hear my students back at school, I hear it in the community. Whenever I give a, a, a lecture or something, I hear the youth coming to me, and the first thing they do, my father takes my rights, my mother tells me what to do and she annoys me all the time, my parents hate me, my parents do this to me, my parents take my right, my parents do this, my parents do that unjust to me, they complain and complain and nag. Brothers and sisters, get over it, really, get over it. And when you hear this hadith and ayat now, you will understand why I'm saying get over it. I know this young man, very close to me. One day his friends gave him two dogs as pets. He entered the house and his mother said to him, either you come in or you and the dogs leave. So he chose to leave with the dogs. For a few days, then he realized how important his parents are, he came back. One day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this young man into a trial. And I think, and Allah knows best, He put him through this trial because I know that this young man is a very special young man actually. But he took the wrong way because of bad friends. As the Rasul sallallahu told us, you bring your friends closer and your parents away. Misled. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for a servant that he loves, he puts a trial toward, he, he, he makes them go through a trial of hardship because that's the only way they will wake up if he loves that person. He wants him back. But if he doesn't love them, he lets them go astray. This young man was put through a very, very strenuous trial. Through this trial, he was imprisoned for a year and a half. No one, he realized, could equate to his mother and father. Everyone abandoned him, except his mother and father. It was through this trial, this young man not only returned back to his Lord, even though he was in solitary confinement, innocently put in prison. Only to know at the end of it, he became more intelligent, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He came out praying his five daily prayers, and now he understands the true value of parents. I said to him, how about one day I bring you along with me to a lecture and you talk about your experience and talk to the youth about how valuable parents are. He spoke to me a few times and I said, you are speaking deep words because you went through that experience. Your parents. Let me tell you, why is it that our Quran and Sunnah concentrate so much about the rights of parents more than what it mentions about the rights of children? Did you realize that? If you look into the Qur'an, you look into the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, you will find numerous ayat, numerous ahadith, which reminds the children to respect and obey and be good towards their parents, more than what you will find about parents giving their rights to their children. A young person may ask, why is this emphasis so much about parents? You know, 
I'll tell you why. Because Allah created the parents with an instinctive nature. They can't help it. An instinctive nature to love their children. They will put their lives at stake for their children. They will sacrifice everything they have for their children. Even when they're angry at their children and they ground them or punish them, it is only because of their intense love for them because they don't want them to fall. Especially the mother. Especially the mother, especially the mother, and then the father. Except in very isolated situations. The mother and the father will give everything they have for their children. And let me ask you a question. I'm not talking Quran and Sunnah now, I'm talking nat natural ways. You see, when the Quran and Sunnah doesn't talk about something too much, it means it's a very natural thing. You know, when something's very natural, you don't need to talk about it too much. You know, it's, it's the norm. I'll ask you a question. Hands up if you are a parent. Hands up all the parents. I can see the shadow of the sister, so if you can put your hand up, I can see the shadow of your arms. If you are a parent, yes, mashallah. You are a parent. Youngsters, I want you to listen. If you are not a parent, look, listen to the question that I'm asking your parents, because this is going to happen to you one day. Hands up, O oh parents. If you, or actually everybody, hands up if you would like to see anyone else achieve more than you in life. Just generally. No, no seriously, come on. Don't, don't just put your hand up like that. None of us instinctively like to see anyone better than ourselves. Isn't that right? I mean, let me give you a humorous question. If you had a group photo with some people, and then someone gave you that photo, who do you look at first? Okay? You look at yourself first, right? Because instinctively, we worry about our own personal state. Parents, I ask you, would I be correct? Hands up if you think that I'm correct in saying this. We as parents naturally don't like to see anyone better than ourselves except one. The only person we like to see better than ourselves is our son or daughter. Hands up if you agree with me. We like to see our children achieve more than ourselves. And in fact, we don't get jealous of them, but we get very proud of them. Isn't that right? For example, if I made a halfway to being a doctor, what I would yearn for, and this will explain to the youth why your parents pick on you a lot in education, I would love to see my son achieve what I didn't achieve to become that doctor. If I didn't become the alim that I also always imagined, I would love to see my son even becoming more than that. And I've already burdened my son saying to put, trying to put in his head now, what do you want to become? He said, I don't know. So you want to become a doctor? Yeah. You want to become an alim? Yes. Doctor and alim. That's highest, you know. Doctor and alim in both worlds. We put this into our children because we want to see them achieve more than us. SubhanAllah, it's instinctive in the parents to want the best for their children. However, the opposite is not true. The children can never love their parents as much as what the parents love their children. And in fact, there comes a time where that love becomes even less, and that's when you get married, and when you have children of your own. Your focus becomes on your children and your wife or your husband. More so for the men. But guess what's happening to their grandparents? When you have children, the grandparents, it will be as though they are living their life again, as if you are born again. We have a saying in Lebanese, says, uh, there is nothing more valuable than the child, except the child of the child. That's why grandparents, when you keep your children with their grandparents, they become very spoiled. Because the parents, when they were raising you, responsibility, they see their sons and daughters looking after their own children. They say, we don't have to raise them anymore. Now we can give them the candy, we can make them uh, stay up in the night, we can make them watch whatever they want, play and do whatever they want, because that's what they've always wanted for you. But they have a commitment to their responsibility. So don't complain about your parents pampering your children, my brothers and sisters. They are only wanting to do what they wanted for you. There is another verse in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
أو هناك ترجم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حملته وهنا على وهن وفصاله في عامين أنش أنشكر لي أنشكر لي ولوالديك إلي المصير وإن جاهداك على أن تشرك بي ما ليس لك به علم فلا تطعهما وصاحبهما في الدنيا معروفا سورة لكمان verse 14 Allah says and we commanded man the human being to be dutiful towards his parents his mother carried him agony and pain upon agony and pain and she went through labor and then breastfed him or her for two whole years behold thank me and thank your parents and to me you will return and if your parents strive in jihad jahadak they strive with all their might to make you make partners with me, disbelieve in me, in ways which you have no knowledge of or which I have not commanded you to do so, then do not obey your parents if they do that. However, still maintain your duty of kindness towards them. Live with them on good terms. In this verse Allah subhanahu wa is saying something remarkable. Allah says, we command you to be good towards your parents and then he mentions your mother. She carried you agony upon agony. This is in pregnancy. Uh, I challenge any man here or youngster and just place it underneath your shirt. And I want you to walk around. Just one day and one night. You're not allowed to take that soccer ball out. Have it, sit, stand. You've got to go to school. You've got to go to your work with the soccer ball in there. And then when you go to sleep, you have to start just the soccer ball. I bet you can't even sleep the night. I bet you can't even do what you want to do. It's going to be so difficult, it's just a soccer ball. Your mother carried you for nine whole months. And you kept getting bigger and bigger. It didn't get easier, right? The bigger you became, the heavier you became. And the more back pains and the kidney pains. And then it comes with side effects. Cholesterol and diabetes and the body changes. And then she's never the same as before. It's all your fault. And we forget this. Yet even upon that, Allah gave her the strength. And then she breathed you for two whole years or so. Again, pain and agony, I don't want to describe because we may have young sisters who are not married. Or those who don't have children, they'll probably be put off from having children. But subhanAllah, Allah gives you this intuition to want to have children. And then Allah says, if your parents strive to make you make partners with Allah, meaning they're non-Muslim, they're kuffar, strive, Meaning they're absolute kuffar. They hate the deen. They hate Allah. And not only are they telling you and advising you, they're telling you jahadat. Meaning they'll strive in every way. And probably even put you through torture to make partners with Allah. Allah says, nearly, nearly, don't obey them. Don't torture them back. Don't abuse them. Don't spit at them. Don't hurt them. Don't hit them. Nothing. Just don't obey them. Don't listen to them about that. And still on top of that, even though they're telling you to make partners with me, Allah says, still live with them on good terms. This is the state of Ibrahim alayhi salam as tribe. Ibrahim alayhi salam maintained making dua for his father until his father died and even after that until he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down a verse telling him, you're not allowed to make dua for your father to put him in paradise or forgiveness if he has chosen to die as a disbeliever. This was his choice. Now it is my right. The Prophet ﷺ was rising the mimbar one time and the Sahabas heard him say the following words Ameen Second time Ameen Third time Ameen When he finished the Sahabas asked him Ya Rasulullah What is the wisdom behind you saying Ameen, Ameen, Ameen And by the way Realize that the Sahabas never asked the Prophet ﷺ why? Rather they said, Mal hikmah. What is the wisdom behind it? Or the likes. 
And that's why I tell the youngsters, when you want to ask your parents a question, never ask them by saying, why did you do that? Why did you do this? Why did you... Don't say why. Why is actually a rude word. But rather ask them, father, mother, what's the lesson behind what you did? What's the wisdom behind that? So they said, what is the wisdom behind you saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ya Rasulullah? Oh, we heard you saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ya Rasulullah. Benefit us. He said, Jibreel alayhi salam came to me and said, May his nose be rubbed in dust. Whoever approaches Ramadan and Ramadan is finished and still their sins are not forgiven. I said, Ameen. Then he said to me, May his nose be rubbed in dust, may, meaning may be disgraced. Whoever hears my name being mentioned and doesn't send salutations upon me. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I said, Ameen. And then he said, Jibreel making a dua against these people. He said, may his nose be rubbed in dust, in other words, be disgraced. Whoever reaches their parents in old age, and still they did not be the cause for him or her entering paradise. I said, Ameen. You know what that means? It means one of the greatest opportunities of you entering paradise is your parents reaching old age while you are still living with them or they are still living while you are around and they die and they still could not make you enter paradise meaning they died displeased with you and this was the greatest opportunity for you to enter paradise because of them you know it's like someone bringing a pot of gold and places it in your bedroom and says to you it's yours all you have to do is take it and it's in front of you and you say, I don't want it. I don't want it. So, in other words, may his nose be rubbed in dust. In other words, what a great loser this person is. After having that opportunity. And this hadith occurs in Tuhfat al-Ahwad. And there is a similar hadith like it, where the Prophet ﷺ repeated it three times. He said, how disgraceful they are. Disgraced they are. Disgraced they are. Whoever. And the Sahaba said, who ya Rasulullah? Who? We beg of you, who? He said, the one who reaches his parents in old age, and still we came up into paradise. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, He who is pleased to have his provision increased. You want to get wealthy? You want to have land? You want to have many houses? You want to be happy? Luxurious in life? He who wants this to be increased in his lifetime, and his lifespan be extended, meaning you want to live longer and healthy, and happy, then let him keep relations with relatives and kinship. Kinship means ar-rahim, which is the womb that resides in the mother. Meaning everyone who is connected to the mother or the father, keep their relationships. And your parents are the first of them. Narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari and Riyadh al-Salihin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا Which means, O oh people, protect yourselves from the displeasure of, of your Lord, the one who created you from a single soul. And he made from this single soul a spouse and made from them many nations and tribes. Many men and many women, and fear your Lord, the one who will question you in relation to the womb and the relatives of the womb of your mothers. Allah is watching over you in every action you are doing. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation, this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, He created the womb. And the woman complained to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Oh my Lord, I fear that people will cut me off. Then Allah said to the woman, Will it satisfy you if I disconnect from myself anyone who disconnects you? And whoever connects you, I will connect them to myself. 
And the woman said, I am satisfied, my Lord. Allah said, then let it be for you. In other words, if you want to be connected to Allah, then it's through your parents. It is not enough for a person to be praying and fasting and going to Hajj tens of times and giving da'wah out there to every person and people converting on their hands into Islam and them going out into jihad and them donating everything they have and they die even on the battlefield in the best of ways while their parents are displeased with them. You will not enter Jannah. You will not enter Jannah, my brother and sister. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to go on jihad with you. I want to sacrifice my life. It was a voluntary jihad. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, Alaka um, do you have a mother? He said, yes, she is old in age. He said, who's looking after her? He said, I'm her only son. He said, Burraha, go and be dutiful towards her. Is it Jannah that you are seeking through this jihad? He said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Falzam qadamayha. Go and serve her feet, for there is paradise. <coughs> now, unless it's compulsory jihad, it's a different story. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith which is narrated in At-Tabarani, three acts will render one's deeds useless. Shirk, violating parents' rights, and fleeing from the battlefield. Shirk, violating the parents' rights and fleeing from the battlefield. Al-Hasan al-Basri, one of the tabi'een said, to be dutiful towards the parents, which is called in Arabic bir, bir al-walidayn. He says bir, towards parents means obeying their orders except in that which Allah has forbidden. In contrast, uquq, which means disobedience to the parents, means neglecting the parents and withholding one's kindness from them. Narrating Dar al-Qutni. How many young people hold their kindness from their parents? How many young people, when it comes to the parents, mother gets up and says, son, take me to the doctors. The son says, mom, it's the World Cup. I need to watch Brazil and Argentina. Who's going to win? Come on, mom, how cruel are you? This is the only my friends are watching and everybody's watching and they want me to take. Mom, just wait. Take a taxi. The shaitan comes and says, yes, do that, do that. And he climbs on top of the youth's shoulders and dangles his feet saying, Woohoo! Look at what I'm doing! I'm making this son or daughter denying themselves from Jannah. And then the mother turns around and says, May Allah guide you, my son or daughter. And the shaitan replies by saying, Damn! She still makes dua for him or her. Now, even in that case, the person goes on a trip and is too busy to call their mother and father a mere phone call. Men who are married, and I hear about this, the wives prevent and limit their husbands from their connection with their mums and dads. And what's worse than that is that the husband listens to them. Or husbands who prevent their wife from meeting with their mother and father. And I've heard this many times. Sisters complaining, saying, my husband prevents me from going over to my mum and dad because he doesn't like them. I say, subhanAllah, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق. Rasul Sallallahu said, there is no obedience to any creation if it means the disobedience to the Creator. Your husbands are not your gods. We are not their gods. We are merely being given this trust in our hands, brothers and sisters. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the one who gave us this trust. <coughs> there is a hadith which is narrated in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Shall I not inform you of the biggest of the major sins? You know, we hear about major sins, right? Imagine Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, I want to tell you, not just the major sin, the biggest of the major sins. Like this tops the cake. He said, and he asked it three times, Shall I not tell you of the biggest of the major sins? Shall I not tell you? Shall I not tell you? The Sahaba said, Please tell us, Ya Rasulullah. He said, A shirk. Make it part of Allah and to be undutiful to one's parents. Some people have a problem when they have non-Muslim parents. I've been asked this question. How do I show my obedience to them when they are non-Muslim? I repeat, Allah says, and if they strive to make you make partners with Allah which He has not commanded you, then do not obey them, but still live with them on good terms. 
الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم there was أسماء بنت أبو بكر she said يا رسول الله my mother has come to visit me for some purpose and her mother was still an idolater should I uphold ties of kinship with her and he said yes uphold ties of kinship with your mother صحيح البخاري you can never my dear brothers and sisters repay your parents for their hardship this is why whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim Allah is just and he commands justice you need to repay your parents brothers and sisters in Islam you know a brother once who came to me wallahi I honored him really high after he told me about this he says brother I got married and my parents mistreated me in my marriage they didn't like my wife and my wife began to hold a grudge towards my parents because of that grudge she felt that my parents were stepping on me you know she kept saying to me why do you keep listening to them and going over and doing what they want you're being stepped on this brother of mine I asked him what did you do about it he said of course I didn't listen to my wife about this I said did you still treat your wife with justice and care he said yes I said good I go I said to him what did you do towards your parents he said I maintained my ties with them even though it looked like they were mistreating me I said well how did they mistreat you he said they don't call me they don't ask about me they ask about my siblings more and they don't come to see me very often I have to always go to them I said good you maintain that for they don't even have any obligation whatsoever to come to visit you or call you in fact if they never called you again and never visited you ever or even mentioned you you still owe them for in all those years that you were raised with them what did you give them back how could you even equal what they have given you you owe them already you're in debt you're in debt Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hadith is inside Muslim Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting and then was lying down then he sat up and he said you are to be dutiful towards your parents I'm paraphrasing and a man stood up and said Ya Rasul Allah wa in zalamah even if his parents have oppressed him they wronged him then the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lifted his arms up and said three times wa in zalamahu wa in zalamahu wa in zalamah even if they oppressed him even if they oppressed him or even if they oppressed him or not Zurrah ibn Ibrahim one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said a man came to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu and said I have an old mother who is unable to go to answer the call of nature so I carry her on my back I also help her perform wudu while turning my face away from her out of respect have I fulfilled my duty towards her? Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu replied no you have not the man said, even though I carry her on my back and exert myself in the service. Umar radiallahu anhu said, you see, she used to do the same for you when you were young, while hoping that you will live. As for you, you wait when she will go away. It can never be equal. When she was raising you, she was anticipating looking forward for the day when she will see you blossom and live but now what, are you, what can you look forward to? no matter what you do of goodness towards her all you see ahead is her death you see your parents death so how they can never be equal it's impossible and this hadith is uh, narrated by Ibn al-Jawzi in his book Birr al-Walidain there is another hadith by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu when he was translating or interpreting the ayah anishkur li wa li walidayk Allah says thank me and thank your parents he said this means if you think Allah but not appreciate your parents then, his, then your thanks to Allah will not be accepted and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said this hadith in sahih al-jama' he said the Lord is pleased with the pleasing of the parents and the Lord is angry with him who angers their parents Jihad in the path of parents, a hadith narrated by Al-Tabarani. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, a man, or that uh, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, a man passed by one day showing eagerness and vigor 
in seeking his means of livelihood. Meaning, the Sahabas were sitting the Prophet and they saw a man passing by, he was going towards his work. But he was, you know, striving, looking here, working there, in labor, earning his livelihood. The Sahabas looked and said, SubhanAllah, what kind of a man is this? They said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, we feel sorry for him. If only he could use his energy for the sake of Allah. In jihad, for example. And Rasul Sallallahu turned to them and said, If this man is going and working hard in order to support his young children, which he has, then he is on jihad. Or if he is working to support two elderly parents, which he has, then he is on jihad. And if he is working to support himself so that he will not beg, then he is on jihad. But if he is doing that to show off and full of pridefulness, then it is in the path of the shaitan. So jihad is through the parents as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised Yahya alayhi salam and mentioned Isa alayhi salam in the dutiful towards their parents. In the hadith, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, when a man came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, and you all know this hadith, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Man ahaqqu al-nari bi suhbati? Who are all the people has the most right of my companionship towards them? Rasulullah and my service, Rasulullah sallam replied, Ummuk, your mother. He asked, Thumma man, then who? He said, your mother. He said, Thumma man, then who, ya Rasulullah? He said, I say your mother. Qala Thumma man, he said, who then? Qala Thumma abak, then your father. A lot of people ask this question, how can this be, why? Ibn Hajar rahmatullahi alayhi comments by saying this is because the mother goes through three stages which, stages which the father can never go through. Number one, she goes through the first stage of pregnancy. This is number one. The second stage is delivery, the labor. And then third stage is breastfeeding. And each one of these stages the father could never go through. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, your mother, your mother, your mother, then your father. The father then comes into the stage of assisting the mother and the mother assisting the father in raising you. Also, in the Sharia, if the father goes poor and the son is able to help, then he must spend on his mother in precedence over his father. This is what this hadith means as well. My brothers and sisters in Islam, now I go to the etiquettes and manners of how we must treat our parents in our daily life. My brothers and sisters, listen carefully. There is a story about Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. He says, I was walking one time and then I saw one of the companions of the Prophet by the name of Abu Ghassan al-Dabi. I saw him walking in front of an elderly man. So he was walking and this young man was walking in front of an elderly man on their way. I came up to this man, Abu Ghassan, and I asked him, and they were in Madinat al Munawwara. I said, Who is that elderly man walking behind you, Abu Ghassan? And Abu Ghassan replied by saying, That's my father. Abu Huraira then stopped him and said the following words. He said, Ya Abu Ghassan, you have missed correctness and you have contradicted the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do not walk in front of your father, only behind him or on his right side when he walks. And do not let anyone separate between you and him while you are walking. Do not take a bone that has meat on it to eat it, which your father has looked at, for he might have wanted that bone with the meat to eat it himself. Do not look straight at your father towards his eyes in sharpness. Do not sit until he sits and do not sleep at home until he goes to sleep first. Because maybe he will need something from you. Now this is the ideal character towards our fathers and mothers. This hadith is narrated in Nuttabarani. Some youngsters today who don't understand the value of their parents until they become parents themselves and then they realize when it's too late when it's too late. What do they do? When they are sitting on the table or on the ma'idah when they're eating, 
I want to show you of ways that they disobey their parents and they don't realize with this Western influence and other influences. If their mother and father ask them to do something which they don't like or too lazy to do, and the son or daughter is thinking of going on their PlayStation or their Wii game, or they've got someone to chat to on Facebook, you know, they've got something very important, what are they going to say? Hey, what are you doing today? Did you listen to that last music clip? Ah, <gasps> is that what you're doing tomorrow? Can I come with you? What do they say? Shabab mashghuluna bila muhimma, as the scholars say. Young people, busy without any duty. What are they busy about? I dyed my hair today blonde. I want to show you here. Click. Did you get it on Facebook? Look. Do you like it? Ooh, that's really good. OMG. <laughs> Or the boys, too busy for their parents, wanting to go on Facebook or chit chatter. You know, we used to have MSN, but now it's died out, right? This is for the, you know, the youngsters. Now they're coming up and saying, hey, did you meet her? Tell me, tell me, what did you talk about? Are you going to go on another date with her? Our youngsters have got several hats now, unfortunately. In the past, in the past, our parents used to be afraid when their children, when we used to go out into the streets. They used to think, where are they going? Who are they walking around with? So when we're at home, they feel safe. Today, unfortunately, with great sorrow, it has become opposite. The children sitting at home in their own bedroom, and they are worse off in what they are doing on the internet than them being outside. They are exploring everything and doing everything in their own bedroom. In their I mean, for me, this is something abnormal. For me, a child is meant to be outside playing there. What is a child doing inside their bed? I mean, we used to ground the children by saying, go to your bedroom. Go to your room. And they say, oh, I don't want to go to the room. My friends are waiting. Now, we have to ground them by saying, go outside and play. The child says, I don't want to play. Come on. I want to sit inside the bedroom. Why do you want to sit inside the bedroom? You find they've got their own internet and laptop. I advise you parents, and I know that the youngsters are going to hate me for this. I don't care. You're going to hate me. All right? Hate me because I'm going to say it in your face. Parents, never leave the internet or the computer in their bedroom. Don't buy them one to keep for themselves. Always keep it out in the lounge where everybody can see. Keep it on the table and turn it around so that even guests can see it. Everyone. Establish a bit of trust with them. Give them your password for one of your accounts, but make your private account with a separate password so that you can establish trust between them. We're going to talk about that, inshallah, in two days about youth culture. But anyway, children, they're sitting on the table. And they don't like what their parents are asking them. So they bring a cup and they're drinking it. Parents ask them, son, can you please take out the rubbish? Bang! They slam the cup on the table. Or they get up and they listen to their parents, but the way they go is like this. They stamp their feet. After doing what they do, the mum and dad say, Allah yudalik. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with you, son or daughter. And you know, they go ahead when their mum and dad say these things. So spoiled. They go into their room and slam the door. <laughs> or they look at their parents sharply you have disobeyed them or they uh, what do they do they they, 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 uh, they shrivel their lips like that and they breathe heavily <laughs> why can't you ask my sister how come I always have to do this how come we have to do everything why can't the boys do the dishes sometimes Always me. Oh, and the poor parent is sitting there. Then, then the mother ends up going up and doing the dishes and vacuuming and doing while the parent, while the children are fighting. Allahu Akbar. You should be racing each other towards that. There is paradise. There is paradise. Sometimes they go far out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say in the Quran, don't even say far out to them. He said, don't even say uff. Al-Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, which is narrated by Ibn Abbas, he says, if there was in the Arabic language a word that was more inconspicuous, more subtle, more simpler, more less in meaning than uff, Allah would have mentioned it in the Qur'an. Uff. Far out is worse. Oh my God is double worse. How can you say, oh my God, when God told you, obey them, and you say, oh my God, who are you really uh, disobeying here? Your God or your parents? Allah. So these are worse than that. 
الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم in Sahih Bukhari Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As says a man came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to give him allegiance saying I have come to give my bay'ah my allegiance to perform hijrah to Medina in hijrah we all know how important that is but I left my parents crying in the hadith it doesn't mention whether his parents were Muslim or not he says I left my parents crying ya Rasulullah al-Rasul صلى الله عليه وسلم said to him then go back and make them laugh as you made them cry. Then you can go on hijrah with me. This hadith is in Musnad Ahmad. There will come a time when people will curse their parents. These are the signs of the last hour and you will find these hadiths in Sahih al-Jami' and in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari how they will curse their parents. People will disown their parents and become disobedient to them. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Indeed, on the Day of Judgment, Allah has servants which He will not speak to them, nor will He purify them, nor will He look at them. And Sahabas asked them, Who are they, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Those who disown and abandon their parents, and those who disown their children, and those who, and the person who was granted favor by people, but they deny it, and they disown these people. And this hadith is in Musnad Ahmad. Uh, Cutting off your parents is the worst of sin and cutting off their relatives and friends is also a great sin. There is a beautiful story and I wish if you can give me five more minutes. Uh, I just want to end it with this you know, strength insha'Allah. And I want to just cover a little bit about when parents died. There was a young man who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complaining to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, my father takes my money. He always asks me for money. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, well, call your father. He went to call his father. Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu in that time. And he said to him, Rasulullah, when the father comes to you, ask him what you want. But ask him this question as well. Ask him, what were you saying in secret on your way here? Father was muttering something which his son couldn't hear. He said, ask him what he was saying. When the father approached the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, is it true what your son is saying? The father said, Ya Rasulullah, if he only knew what I'm using his money for anyway. I'm using it to look after his poor auntie. She is left without anybody. Where else am I putting it? Only in places where I have to. Using it towards his family. Because I'm poor. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, look, Ask, I want to ask you a question. Tell me about what you were saying in secret when you were coming towards me here. The father looked at the Prophet ﷺ and said, I made some verses of poetry. Rasul ﷺ said, Please say them to me. And he said, إذا ليلة نادتك بالسقم لم أبت بسقمك إلا ساهرا أتم الملو which means O oh son I nourished you when you were a baby and I looked after you in care as you grew up until you became an adolescent you lived upon what I worked for and strived and sacrificed in my body and time and wealth so that you may live healthy. Whenever a night passed you, when you were sick or ill or coughed, I was the first to be up, carrying you and looking upon you with my heart, afraid if an atom or a little breeze would harm you in any way. I could not sleep while you seeing you sick until you slept and then I slept. And then he said, كأني أنا المطروق دونك بالذي طرقت به دوني فعيني تحمل. He said, when I ceased to see you sick, it was as if I was the one who was sick and ill, and so my eyes would always overwhelm with tears, but you never knew. And then he said, 
فلما بلغت السن والغاية التي إليها مدى ما كنت فيك أؤمل جعلت جزائي غلظة وفضاضة كأنك أنت المنعم المتفضل He said and when he finally reached the adulthood which all my life I was anticipating and looking forward to seeing you become that I mean this is all he's doing right He's raising him waiting for the day he's going to get married The day when he will get his qualifications and finish The day when he will get his skill The day when he can stand on his feet The day when he will rejoice He said until you reach the day when I have all my life anticipated in my heart to see you reach and rejoice You gave me a reward And your reward was harshness And frowniness And mistreatment As if I am the one who owes you and you owe me nothing. The way you treated me is like what a neighbor would treat his neighbor. I wish that you even gave me that. Al Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he looked up at the father and the father looked at him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's beard was soaked with tears. From his emotion, Al Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grabbed the boy from his chest. He shook him and said to him, Anta wa maluka li abik. You, and everything you own belongs to your father. This uh, hadith is narrated in Ibn Majah. Today we see children taking their own parents to court because they took their house or their property. Allahu Akbar. And finally, my brothers and sisters in Islam, Rasul Sallallahu was asked by a man who came to him, and this hadith is in Sunan Abi Dawood. He asked him, while the companions were sitting there, they said, a man from Banu Salama came to the Prophet ﷺ one day and said, Ya Rasulullah, is there any kindness left that I can do to my parents after they have died? <coughs> Rasul ﷺ replied, yes, there are four things that I can tell you right now. Making dua for Allah to forgive them. Brothers and sisters, don't think that if they've died, that our duty towards them has been cut off. You still have a duty until your death. Making dua for them, for Allah to forgive them until your death. Number two, to fulfill their promises and their will, which they have left behind. Number three, to be generous to their friends. If you knew that they had friends, be generous towards them, whether you like them or don't. Number four, keep relationships with those whom you are related to through them, like uncles, aunties, uh, uh, Brother, uh, uh, relatives, cousins, Rasul Sallallahu said, this is what kindness remains towards them after their death. In another hadith he says, perform hajj on their behalf. This is why Abu Dawood and Al-Albani says it's sahih. Give charity on their behalf. The hadith is in sahih Muslim. Making up compulsory fasting which you know that they missed out on. This hadith is in sahih Muslim and sahih uh, Bukhari, hadith number 1851 and hadith 1147. Also fulfilling their vows and debts, if they owe people money or whatever, then fulfill it for them. This hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Maintaining the ties, Rasul Sallallahu said, the best of good deeds is keeping ties with father's friends. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. Again, dealing with non-Muslim parents, I say it one more time, Dealing with non-Muslim parents is also a duty to be done in goodness. Obeying them of forbidden things is haram, but obeying them in everything else is a must. Parents, if they tell you to do something of an act which Allah loves, but it is only voluntary, and they say to you, don't do it yet, you must obey them. For example, you want to pray a nafil prayer, and your mother says to you, son, daughter, just help me out before you pray. What do you do? Pray first, or go to your mother first? Go to your mother first. Father says to you, son, can you help me calculate these earnings today? And you are about to go and do a, 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 a sunnah. You listen to your father, or do you do your sunnah? You listen to your father, that is more important. Uh, a parent says to you, son, come out with you. Today I need you to go with me on a journey which requires a bit of work. You say, but it's too hot, I want to fast today, voluntary fasting. Do you listen to your father or father's voluntary fasting? Imam al-Nawawi is the one who gives this fatwa, by the way. He was asked these questions. He said, you listen to your father and help him. That is more important than voluntary fasting. And Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, when his mother 
was a disbeliever, he went to her one day and she abused the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he went and complained to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him, "Ya Abu Huraira, be good towards her still." And Abu Huraira said, "Can you make a dua for Allah to guide my mother?" Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam made that dua. He said, "I went back home, and my mother would not open the door. She said, 'Son, don't come in. I'm bathing.'" After she bathed, she put her clothes on and came out to me and said, "Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah." وأن محمدا رسول الله أبو هريرة from that day his relationship with his mother was so intense that till today we use Abu Hurair رضي الله عنه in most of the hadiths in relation to how to treat his mother and father they used to say why doesn't Abu Hurair eat with his mother he said because I fear that if my mother has her eye on a piece of food and I may reach for it without knowing I would have disobeyed my mother I want her to eat what she loves and then I will eat the crusts Obey your parents, my dear brothers and sisters. Make your own personal choices. For example, you buy something that you like. Your parents say, "Don't buy that." You buy a car. You want a motorbike. They say, "Don't buy that, son or daughter." Obey them, even if you want to. Don't say to them, "This is my right. Why don't you let me go out? Why don't you let me buy this?" All my friends have a mobile phone. All my friends they've got this and they've got that. All my friends they get to go out to parties and here and there. How come I can't go? And you sit there disobeying your parents. Wallahi, you are in great strife if you do so, my brother and sister. Because one day Allah will give you children who will do the same things. This is how the predecessors were, and this is how they were our role models. Lastly, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Has anyone heard of him? Imam Ahmad, I'll finish it with this. You know, in this day and age, they have this uh, silly, silly statement. When uh, someone listens to their mother or father too much, right? They actually insult that person. And when a person listens to his mother a lot, they say, huh, "He's a mummy's boy." You know, one sister once came along after giving a lecture, and, he, and she said, "You know, a brother has asked for me my hand in marriage." I said, "Good. Who is he?" She said, "So and so." I said, "Masha Allah is a great man." She said, "But you know, they're saying that uh, he comes from, uh, you know, he, him and his siblings. They, they said that they're uh, mummy's boys." I said, "That's why you should marry him then." She said, "Why?" Okay, if he treats his mother that well, then he's going to treat you well. If he treats his sisters well, he's going to treat you well. He's good to females. He's good to women. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. His mother became a widow when she was only 18 or 17 years old. Her son was an orphan, Imam Ahmed. She vowed never to get married in order to raise her son and give him the best education. <coughs> Imam Ahmed never got married until he was 40 years old. You know why? Because he vowed that he will never replace his mother with anyone or have a distraction, so that he can repay what his mother sacrificed. She died when he was forty. In all those years, he never disobeyed his mother in any way. In fact, he used to go out with his friend Yahya ibn Nuaim, and one day he said to him, "Let's cross, let's cross the Tabaraya, the Tigris River. There is a scholar on the other side, so we can learn knowledge from." And he was twenty-one years old. He said to him, "No, I can't cross the Tigris River." He said, "We're just crossing over, man. You're twenty-one year old. We're just seeking knowledge." He said, "No, my mother told me never to cross the Tigris River." And many other stories about him. Do we call him a mummy's boy? No. No. For he knows that there, her feet, if he serves them, there lies Jannah. My brothers and sisters. I end it with this: the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is in Bukhari. Your parents are your heaven, or they are your hell. By the obedience and dutifulness to your parents, you are obeying and being dutiful to Allah, and through them is your Jannah or Jahannam. Wallahu billah. I hope that this lesson was a wake-up call for all of us. Go, my brothers and sisters, tonight. And renew your covenant with Allah. Secondly, renew it with your parents. Go down and kiss their feet. Kiss their feet, literally, and say to them, "Mum and Dad, forgive me for any time where I was careless towards you. 
I want paradise and you are my door towards it. And repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you among the successful. Allahumma ghfir lana dhunubana. Allahumma ja'al abawayna sababan lidukhulin al-jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and to make our parents one of the causes of us entering paradise. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us good parents and to give us an offspring who are righteous and comforting to our eyes. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite this ummah and to return us back to the glory which we once had. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله